Hello everybody. Hello. Welcome back to Wandering Into Wellness. And today we are really excited to have, actually, is it our first returning guest? After. As in we had Sarah on. Oh, our well, first like returning guest. Returning guest. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So, so Sarah Sproul, hello. Uh, so Sarah is a sex educator. We had her on before to talk about how to maybe navigate the conversations with your kids about sex and, and how that can kind of like be a part of a household and, and not be something that gets hidden and something that can be really like explored in a really safe way so that everybody feels cozy with it. And today we wanted to have you on, Sarah. Um, because, well, Lydia sent to me a, an Instagram post last week that was, uh, gave the, the kind of the, the outline of this, um, this education kind of template called Flourish, which seemed to us on the face of it to be in terms, it was a sex education kind of like program or whatever for Catholic schools in Ireland. And it seemed to us to kind of be not as inclusive as we would like, and maybe not as progressive as we would hope considering what we think young people need and what we think we missed out on ourselves. And then we saw that it was authored by the Irish Bishops Association, I think they're called. And that for us was a bit strange. And I suppose we wanted to see what your thoughts were. I'm sure you've, you've come across this and I'm in your world. Like what's the response when you see something like that coming out today in the day, in, like, as, like in a world where we don't really have to think about things in that kind of like Catholic heteronormative sort of way anymore. Do you know, Finn, when it came out, I remember um, someone, I have a membership of parents who want to do really good conversations with their kids. And one of them is a teacher and she sent it to me straight away, right before all the hoi polloi started. And I looked and I went, yeah, there's nothing surprising there. Like it was like, it was like non news because in the sex education world, we all know what is going on in a lot of schools. And so in a sense, that was just putting it down in a much more nicely designed PDF. And okay. it was, it was actually, it was actually super for um, sexuality education as a whole though, because it concretized again, what's going on. And it brought it back into everyone's awareness and focus. And I think actually the bishops or whatever that organization was that, that authored that did us all a massive favor. Because, you know, sometimes when issues, they've been around for a long time and we all get a little bit jaded or we've got other things to talk about and it's still COVID-19 and all that. But when a document comes in like this and is so blatantly, it is what it is, we're like, Okay, no, the, the, the fight still needs to happen about this. Mm. There is lots of social change that needs to um, come into our school system because the kids who are um, being taught a curriculum like that are coming out not only with ignorance, I guess, around basic information to do with their own body and other people's body and all that sort of thing, but also with this idea in the head um, that connects that maybe to being good or being moral or what is right and what what is wrong and and ignorance versus that that's those are two different things ignorance is sort of like oh that's easy you can fill that in with information and support and all that sort of thing a, a misunderstanding or a belief structure that's been um, put in place early on needs to be dismantled really before then you can put in the information so as far as I'm concerned the more we have this conversation the more clear we are about the complexities and the difficulties still around the curriculum that are being taught in various schools I think the better off we're going to be and our kids are going to be what's what's it's really interesting to hear you say that um and really interesting to hear you say that really what it did was just make a concrete reality written down of what's actually already happening because when we posted a little chat that we had around this at the time saying that we were going to have this podcast with you and would people send in their questions and concerns the first response i got on instagram was from a primary school teacher who was very very angry that we had had that chat and said, accused me of spreading misinformation and that I should do some research before I falsely spread this information and that this was not being taught in schools right now. Um, and, and, it, and it threw me a little bit and I had to go away and just really research to make sure that I wasn't incorrect on it. But it showed me that like, 
teachers that are teaching now, maybe they, they aren't aware that when written down in black and white, this is actually the framework that's being taught. Mm. Look, I, I think we first need to say that every school is going to be different. Even mm -hmm. every Catholic school is going to be different. And um, one of the teachers I was talking to saying that her, the principal in her school was very clear, like this was a take it or leave it thing, that she wasn't going to um, demand that that curriculum be taught. So there's absolutely, there would be some schools that we like, why would we ever do that? But there mm. are some schools that do toe the line. Like I remember when I started um, providing relationship and sexuality education for national schools. So I don't do secondary, I do primary. Um, there was a school in a county um, who engaged me to come up and do fifth and sixth class. So that's 11 and 12 year olds. And um, they were a Catholic school and actually a good few Catholic schools will engage me to come in, which says something about mm -hmm. something. Um, and then about a month before I was due to go up, the principal contacted me and said, look, I'm going to have to cancel that, that contract because one of the parents has done some research on you online and found a video that you did. Um, talking about how when when we talk to children we um, are from from nine to twelve we can talk about the fact that you know some pregnancies for whatever reason um, you know it it's not okay for the pregnant person to be pregnant and I went into a little bit of information about how we could have conversations with children about pregnancy termination and so I wasn't welcome in that school. Now, whether or not, you know, once school is under pressure from parents, particularly if they are under the patronship of a church, then there's not a lot of wiggle room for a principal. And mm -hmm. I feel hugely conscious of what a difficult position that is when mm -hmm. you're interfacing between a school community of parents with all different views and beliefs about how the school should and could support them raising their family versus what the patron is saying. I, I wouldn't wish that job on anyone, yes. but there are some wonderful people with yes. such big hearts that take that on and run with it and like kudos to them. Yeah. Right. And, and so you, so when you're in schools, uh, let's say it's a, a Catholic school and you know that there is an edict there from the Catholic church that has part of the school's program, whether that's being taught like, you know, uh, verbatim or not, does it shape what you're able to say? Are you just, are you no holds barred? Are you, I teach Sarah Sproul and that's how this goes. I like how, like, you know, do you, do you treat every school like you do every person? Like, do you have to treat them like they have a personality and how do you, how do you navigate that? It must be incredibly tricky. Yeah. You know, up until the last few months, my, my approach was, I was willing to work inside broken systems because um, I believed that my presence, like who I am, how I speak, the nuance I could bring to even a curriculum that is broken was worth it for the children in that classroom. And I still absolutely fundamentally believe that because de depending on what school I would go into, you know, I would have a little chat to the teacher and the principal and they'd say, and I'd say like, what the kid, I know the questions kids ask now. They're gonna ask me about condoms and they're gonna ask me about all these things. What's the deal with that? Like, I'm happy to answer those. And then they would say, well, actually, no, you're not allowed to answer questions about condoms, right? And so after about two years of doing that, but still fundamentally believing that I was bringing value, something valuable and important to those children in the classroom, it got to the point where it, it's really utterly exhausting to work within a system like that. Mm. And I'm sure there will be some teachers who are watching this that will agree. Like you come in and you have your personal values and the way you care for your children at home. And then you're working in this, a structure that you have to sort of shift that. So mm. um, I think since I've had experience of like, I went into a school a few months back and it was an educate together school and I won't say where it is but they have children in that classroom who were um, out as being gender non-binary gender queer and and these kids are in sixth class right so that whole approach to delivering a sexuality and relationship education curriculum was 
so like breathtakingly amazing. I, I actually feel a bit emotional talking about it because what that school was providing and encouraging was conversations about really nuanced beautiful parts of being human related to gender and related to sexuality and um we we you know the, the way i do relationship as sex ed is everyone is in the classroom together and then towards the end when we have a bit more time i will get different groups of people with similar life experiences so anyone who is in a body that is going to have a period we would all sit down and have a time of chat and discussion and information giving about those sort of bodies and then bodies that have a penis and in this school we got to have a um a non-binary group which was you know if you're just interested in coming to a non-binary group where we're not really talking about bodies as such that we might be as well but we're talking about the complexity of how the world isn't set up necessarily for people who are um a, a little bit different or questioning their gender or their orientation is um, not what someone would expect you to have this is the group for you like how revolutionary is that there yeah. are and 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 kids came to that group and i suppose that's the thing not only what did children feel open enough to be who they are and come to their school and say look this is what's going on for me but in front of their peers they were mm. happy to come to a non-binary circle like it's how astounding. amazing are the youth of today yeah, yeah. Um, and, and did that did that say something about the school that they were in as well was it particularly yeah okay so it's particularly they're able to be that way in that school Yes, and I think this speaks to your point, you know, that mm -hmm. the school structures and the curriculum that is taught does shape how comfortable and how open a child can be about their needs and who they are. And this is not in any way sort of saying horrible things about schools, but we mm -hmm. all, all of us are shaped by the culture we live in or the culture of the organization. Um, you know, like Finn, your shop and yoga and your yoga practice, Lydia, you have values that you bring to both mm -hmm. those things that attract people and create a culture of openness. Some schools prioritize that and some schools are not able to for whatever reason. Yeah. So if you're a parent who's at home at the moment, and you are open with your kids let's say you're good at having the conversations sort of conversations you talk about on your instagram channel and so they're going to be you know in a place relative to their peers that might be more progressive or more like at a, at a better place knowledge wise in terms of their own body in terms of other people's bodies and consent and these things and they're like in the uh, the upper echelons of a primary school so like 11 or 12 and they're sending them into a school where they're getting the the edict that might not be so flexible is is that very jarring for the kid like what like is it you know is it is it better to have this contradictory thing for a kid where they're like i'm this way at home i'm this way in school like how how do you navigate that as a parent that must be very because you're fighting every version of the system then can i also oh, add to that one of the questions that we got in was almost identical to that was actually someone saying um if i'm telling my kid of and actually they were talking about younger age kids like six or seven um if I'm being really, really open with them, and that's the choice that I've chosen at home, but I know that they're going to school in a classroom with other kids that probably don't know anything about sex yet. How do I tell them without saying, you can't talk to other kids about this? How do I explain mm. that dynamic? And so maybe you could talk into yeah, those, the, bits. those yeah. two bits. Yeah. So the world in which we raise children, it's not just about how we talk about sex and bodies that could be countercultural. There can be all sorts of things that our children learn from us at home that the world out there does not support. Like I'm just yeah. thinking food, for example. <laughs> like how do we talk to our kid about the fact that our culture is saturated with things to do with sugar and junk food and all that sort of thing and that in our house, we have actually this additional knowledge and we understand that that is harmful for human bodies. And so these are the choices we make in our house. So it's, it's sort of a similar thing that we can do with sex and bodies. The difference is that there is still stigma 
around mm. sex and bodies. So um, while some of us might be really um, very grounded and absolutely sure that the conversations we have at home with our younger children are important to have that say our child at six year old at six years old knows the three different ways humans can be conceived and they, they have a sort of a good understanding of that and as their caring adult we are sure that even though the world outside wouldn't do the same thing we do not um, question our decision on that at all right so there's mm -hmm. that sort of and that's we're fairly clear a step down from that would be um a parent who understands that, oh, these conversations are super important and I might be able to do them with my child in the privacy of my own home. But there's that feeling of because, and this won't be conscious, but because there's so much stigma around information to do with sex and sex in general, and the stigma then programs our mind to think that conversations and information about sex and the body and genitals and masturbation and all that is somehow dangerous or mm. maybe a little bit bad or dirty or a bit wrong, then there's a whole sort of waterfall of judgment that we fear from other people because of that stigma. And, and, there's, and if you use the food parallel, there's not stigma about that really. Like there's that sense of, okay, the world might not understand about avoiding processed sugars and all those things but there's no stigma looking at us oh you're bad and you're dirty and you're wrong we don't get that as a parent right so there is absolutely this this tension um, I would sort of describe it as being like a pioneer in a sense that as we as a family or as a caring adult if we step into this role and we choose to prioritize what our child needs above um, trying to keep the culture around us relatively comfortable mm. if we're willing to do that essentially what we're doing is we're slotting ourselves between our child and the culture as the adult and we're saying look this is going to be hard we're saying it to ourselves this is going to be hard and we're going to probably piss some people off mm. and probably um at school which i'm saying to myself my mm. kid because they're so excited about this and they it's really interesting and no one else really knows about it. So of course they're probably going to ask my kid is probably going to tell some people and there's going to be blowback. Like I've, I've had that in my life. Right. But if I can with all um, my ability to ground myself and reminding myself that this is about my child, who is most important in this is that the culture is that my child might, of course, my child is most important. Then I am going to stand up and go, okay, I am willing to take on this painful part because I know that I am doing something that is, is breaking a generational pattern and not just breaking a generational pattern in my family, but is fundamentally subversively breaking the, the, the generational patterns of our culture because every mm -hmm. child we raise who has these conversations at home and has a strong adult who is willing to run interference for them to do with the stigma mm. that child is a th person who is going to grow up and and make and create massive social change so mm, yeah yeah so you just have to put a lot of faith in that and, and keep reminding yourself that being the pioneer is a nice way to refer to yeah Sorry. but but here's the thing right Lydia you both your work is about how do we um, how do we upskill ourselves to do hard things, right? Um, and this is another one of those hard things. So the way we would upskill in this situation, you've got your five-year-old, they know what sex is, they're being sent off to school and there's a sex negative culture in that school, would be to surround ourselves by a chosen community or chosen family who believe the same things we do. Now we do this in other parts of our life. People follow religions do this too. But the reason we do that is so we don't feel alone because it's really hard just to be one sort of waving reed yeah. amongst a huge um, yeah. storm of things we don't believe. So you find community, you, you um, ingest or you, you bring in information to your, remind yourself why this is important every week. So maybe that's like sitting in a car or, or you subscribe to some sort of newsletter that, that every week you get a reminder of, yes, this is important because um, 
it's it's easy to lose faith in mm. in something if we don't have the support of other people and then instead of using our child as like instead of them being sort of the battleground we can talk to them well i when my kids were small talk to them super openly about um we know in our house this is super important for kids to have this information because it helps them make good decisions it helps them you know, keep their body safe, um, helps them grow up to be a person that feels confident and strong. And there are going to be some kids at school who don't have that same information. Now, I know, and this is me talking to my kid, I know that it's really amazing to be the kid that knows the most in the playground. And you are probably going to want to share the information with them. And, you know, that's not necessarily, you're not necessarily doing the wrong thing because all children need information. But what I will say is some adults out there may feel like when you share the information that um, that's not the right thing to do, you Mm -hmm. know, and and they might get cross. Now I'm here to support you. You're only a kid. I'm the one that's going to look after you and you don't need to be afraid, but I just wanted to let you know, right? So we're, so we're, because you're really pressing my buttons now, guys, these questions are so good. I'm sort of on a little bit of a rant, but <laughs> the world out there, we, we can't control everything. And so part of our basic parenting is to raise children who have the ability to critically think about mm-hmm. what is around them, critically think about advertisements and the things they see in the media and porn online eventually, and what the school teaches them about the sex ed curriculum and how the parents of the children in the school um, talk about things differently to them. And we're not saying it's wrong necessarily, or you might. I don't say it's wrong. I just say it's different. And purely mm-hmm. purely because I come from um, the point of view that I feel immensely privileged to have this knowledge and to have had mm-hmm. the education that I had and to have grown up in the situation I have. That, that is a privilege. Mm-hmm. And other people are not as privileged in a sense that they don't have the awareness or um, they were heavily involved in uh, mainstream religion and they didn't choose shame. Shame came mm-hmm. to them. So for mm-hmm. me, it's more about recognizing my privilege and then what are the ways that I can um, talk about this part of my parenting in a way that is welcoming and gentle and open rather than sort of accusing and um, you're not doing it right, I am doing it right, why are you getting cross? Yeah, which is kind of like engaging in the shame conversation in a different way, isn't it? You're like perpetuating it in a strange way. I think it's, yeah, it's a really good, it's a really good um it's such a nuanced thing because it's like you said so many of the friends that I have and myself would feel really comfortable to talk to our kids in a really open way but then everyone's knowing full well that they have kids especially my kid who's really chatty and really conversational really social is bound to be going into their school environment and since he was three and talking about all these things and I remember even when he was three it was just knowing correct anatomical names to things and referring to his penis or whatever and that it was very, very jarring and triggering for people within the school and also other parents. And the the confidence I had was that I'm this, I'm doing the thing that's right for me and right for my family and right for my kid. And I felt comfortable with that. But what I didn't feel comfortable was the idea of him being in that classroom situation and being shamed and told off by an authority figure and then feeling that feeling of the shame, which I had been trying to move him away from by being so open. And I think that that's, it's about uh, the question I was going to ask, and I think you answered it is, do we prepare them that other people might respond that way? But then is that programming them to expect that response? Or is it better to just let them know, look, this might happen and then go. And if it does happen, you know, we can expect that. And also here's how we can support you at home. And I think that that's really nice to hear because as you were talking, I was finding myself like, yeah, I know, but I'm really still very nervous yeah. about when he goes into school and he says something and I know he's going to get the response that I know he will get. And then I feel already bad, like, oh, it's horrible that he's going to be made to feel that shame, but I just mm. desperately am trying to protect him from the shame. And I, it's so interesting that this word protecting is coming up because I, the word protection indicates, in my work anyway, a sort of a, a point in parenting. And it happens because our children grow, right? And they grow past the point that we can actually protect them. Yeah. That's just the nature of 
human development. And so it comes to this point where our parenting really, we have to think about it in a different way, Lydia. And it's from, instead of protecting it, it moves into preparation. So it's the analogy I draw is when the kids were small, you know, putting all those little covers over the electrical sockets and the corner protectors on the tables and all that sort of stuff. And then as they get older, then those things can be taken away and, and they understand, well, you know, you don't do that because that's dangerous. And okay, you still could run and fall and hit your head on the corner. But now there needs to be an element of risk involved in mm-hmm. growing up because that's where we're headed in the long term. We're all headed to caring for ourselves in a world that is not a safe world. And so it was beautiful the way you described that there about that feeling you had in your chest. Like, I just want to protect him. But the sooner as parents, we can get to the point where that understanding of, oh no, that's actually not the ultimate parenting act. Mm -hmm. The Mm -hmm. ultimate parenting act is to prepare our child so they uh, we're here for them if they need us, but oh my goodness, they get to go out in the world and sometimes they'll fail and sometimes people will be mean to them, but mm. they have the skills and the resources and they know we have their back, you know, and yeah. that is, that is the success that, um, that we're all working towards at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. It's that roots and wings philosophy of education mm. that Michael Mead always talks about that. And I love when he does that idea that like strong grounding, you can trust an awful lot will go right once there's a really decent base. And I think as well, you're probably particularly, as, as somebody I know was particularly like augured towards when there's a negative response to a thing, you kind of, it, you shy away from going there again. Your son probably isn't that guy. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's interesting, like you, you don't know. I, I think I had some really bad responses. Actually speaking of the food thing, when I was in primary school, I mean, that was really triggering because I was like, uh yeah. it's such a simple thing but I, I had broccoli in my school lunchbox and oh my god I wasn't the popular kid in school I had yeah. I also had them fortunately the cardigans that were knit by my grand which were beautiful <laughs> retrospectively but unfortunately at the time they didn't serve um so like those things they do have an impact but I think and, and you and you go through some hardship for them and there will be hardship for it there, there will be there will be a fight and there will be adventure and there'll be risk but ultimately it's what shapes your character as well isn't it so like trusting that those those wounds and those those smaller wounds that they'll they'll heal and there'll be a development and a, and, a, and a really beautiful development in a person once they're given that strong base thing. Yeah. One one question I want to ask you though, because you make this sound like too simple. That's one of the problems. We're talking to you, you're like, okay, of course, I mean it's so straightforward. I feel like we can finish now. We're done. Like she's just like explained it and now we know what to do and nobody's got any challenge. But like this is a like this is a a job for for kind of for experts, right? And I think one of the things that we kind of have a I think a, a, prob- a problem with or let's say we're, we're kind of maybe taking issue with it's like and, and I just can't understand is how a teacher in a primary school or a secondary school can be given the sense that they are responsible for helping people understand sex in a way when they've come from an education system that definitely hasn't given them that strong ground because they're not taught it right or are they mm. some see I guess this is what's interesting about relationship and sexuality education that it's not necessarily just about the information on the piece Mm. of paper it is about how we as the adults who are teaching that curriculum what what does our body show about our comfort level what does Mm. our face show how are we light in the information or are we heavy you know and and so there is like I'm not an ed- well, I'm a sex educator, but pedagogy and all that sort of thing that underpins teaching is not my strength. I'm a I'm a therapist, so when I think about relationship and sexuality education, I'm really um, focused on the little nuances of um, when I laugh about something, when I'm saying a word and I'm laughing about it on the on the board and it gives the class permission to laugh too. And why am I doing that? Because their body, you know, that there's going to be tension in those kids' body because they're like going, okay, well, maybe a few of them have lots of conversations at home, but not all of them do. And they definitely don't have, won't have had conversations with 28 of their closest and dearest school peers, you know? So there's a lot of um, need to, 
pay attention to what how our bodies react to the sensations that come up when we have conversations like this and um and i think to be to, to do a job that doesn't just educate a child's mind but educates their nervous system which is about like aha uh -huh, hang on a minute i'm sitting in a classroom with someone who they're just saying things and they don't look embarrassed and they don't look <laughs> yeah. upset. And, and when I've asked them the question about, well, what about ball sack, miss? They haven't got annoyed and they haven't got, they're just like, oh yeah, that's slang. But in this class, we're calling it the scrotum, you know? So it's, it's not just about the curriculum. It's about the everyday interaction in the mm -hmm. classroom. And I've had some really, actually some really lovely uh, experiences with classroom teachers, particularly around the what if we get our period at school conversation, where mm -hmm. um, we've been in that circle that I was talking about before. And the, the kids ask me, well, what if we get our period when we're at school? And the classroom teacher says, well, everybody, remember the other day I showed you where the period products were and everyone's going oh yeah I remember and she said and you know you don't flush it flush it through the toilet oh yeah that's right and she said and you know if you can come to me about anything and they're yeah oh yeah we can come to you about everything we'd sort of sort of forgotten so there are some lovely experiences where school classrooms are this beautiful place where children are supported in all aspects of their their growing up but not a lot of classrooms are like that. And that is no, absolutely no fault of um, a teacher. And it does not reflect at all on their ability to teach content mm. at mm. all. It's more about that each of us have a deep programming really mm. from, our, from our growing up. And I'm saying that with tenderness because I had that too, you know, I grew up in a family where, okay, we had a little bit of conversation and my mum did her very best to have a conversation with me about periods, but I like yelled and screamed at her till she left the room, right? And so I know personally what that feels like. Mm -hmm. And, so, and you know, I guide parents through, well, how do we dismantle that? And that takes time again, and it takes community and it takes like a guide who has been there and done that beforehand. So to expect a teacher who hasn't done that work of being guided through what they've been given, mm. it's not fair to ask them to, to teach the curriculum in the way that I'm talking about here that works on multiple levels. Mm. Some teachers can do it because this part that they were given is in alignment with that. Mm. But a lot of teachers can't and that's that's okay for them. The problem mm. is about the kids in that classroom and what they're missing out on. Mm. So Sarah, one of the things that we wanted to talk about today was to go, okay, so this is the this is the guideline for the curriculum for 90% of our national schools right now, let's just say, um, of the, the Catholic schools. It makes up roughly 90%. If we we're saying we don't really agree with that. We feel like there's a lot that's lacking in it. If we were to say to you today, me, you and Finn are now going to create in our head our dream curriculum for primary schools of the topics that we wish would be talked about, what would that include? What would that look like? Yeah, so like, oh, Christmas time, let's create a curriculum. <laughs> um, well. It would, it would be something that's uh, sort of, it pervades every school day, you mm. know, like, and it starts from the minute kids get into junior infants, in, in my opinion, because um, there are conversations that we can have with really young kids, but the principles of consent, uh, body autonomy, and which is in fairness now, you know, there are some curriculums that are taught at national school level, the Stay Safe program, for example, does some work around body autonomy and making sure you talk to an adult and all those sort of things. But I'm more talking about the lighthearted um, teaching that happens between the words, right? Mm -hmm. And, and um, how could we uh, bring relationship and sex education into math, for example, mm -hmm. or English? 
or Irish. I don't know any Irish words for the RSC program, but you know, that sort of thing where we study something through something else. And so it becomes hmm. this, it, it's just there all the time. And so in a sense, the curriculum almost isn't something that just sits on its own. Um, and like principles of consent in the classroom, how do we run a consensual classroom? As a general rule, I would suggest that our schooling and, you know, most schooling is run more as an autocracy, perhaps, where there's sort of a power structure and mm -hmm. children need to do what the adult tells them. And I understand why, because, you know, otherwise anarchy, but we can, we can change the cultures of our institutions so that consent is taught in the very ways that our children are interacted with in the mm. school system, you know? So, um, I know yeah, it's, so it's really, I mean, it, it goes so far beyond like the sexual education part, doesn't it? It really, like you're saying, it's the, the soup of cultural education and, and how that relates to, and, and like you're saying, it's not about the teaching of the body parts. It's not the biology. It's, it's actually about the nature of, I, I kind of, I mean, I, I really, uh, this is a serious blue sky moment really, isn't it? Because you're talking about really fundamentally reorganizing society because we built it on hierarchies really. <laughs> um, like, and, and how, let's say, like, do you think the ultimate version of this type of education system is actually you teaching the educators, like in the same way as psychotherapists have to have their own psychotherapist? And so then that they're just getting to talk to you about their sexual health and that enables and facilitates them to still to be a conduit of the type of voice that you want them to have. Is that the verse? Is that the ultimate version? Or are you still in the classroom? Is it still a specialist job? Oh, no, I think ideally I, you wouldn't have a specialist at all. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I don't want to be in there. Yeah. The, the, the teacher... I mean, I'm just thinking of some of the really fabulous teachers that my kids have had. Um, they're all teenagers now in the secondary school, but pr primary school, that primary school teacher, there is something very sort of almost sacred about the bond between a teacher and a child in a classroom when it's, when it's good, you know? And so I love that idea of yours, Finn, of how could it be possible to help um, teachers or all of us really unpack this thing that sits on our chest that means it's difficult for us to talk in a way that sends those just those subliminal messages of comfort and openness and kindness and acceptance and oh, that's a great idea you should be in charge of the curriculum for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. oh my god don't let me lose have you seen my shot <laughs> i think i think also like body positive it's you know in that it relates to everything though, doesn't it? Because, you know, we were talking about brainstorming this morning and thinking, okay, like what are the topics that we feel or topics that people have sent into us that they think? So it was like body positivity, inclusiveness, definition of terms around LGBTQ and non-binary and understanding those at all the different levels, being able to talk about pleasure, uh, that pleasure is even a part of that conversation around sexuality, um, self-pleasure being a massive part of it as well, especially in the, that, that there wouldn't be a shame around that, that that was a, like a normal thing. Um, the images that we see in the media, applying critical thinking to that, all of these kinds of things. But it's so hard, like even when I'm thinking if I just bring it back to the first one, body positivity, it's very, very hard to be in a classroom talking to a bunch of kids about body positivity if you don't feel very body positive yourself yeah. right and we all have no matter how much work we do we all have some hang-ups around things and so uh, yeah. we bring those with us you know when we walk through our world and our relationships and and naturally in a teaching situation we're bringing them into that situation too and and so what i like what what you're saying is more or what i feel as well is more that it shouldn't be necessarily a strict teaching like here's the information and now learn that information it should be conversational in nature it should be like and mm, here we all are a having a circle and a conversation like you said because that way then everyone gets to share their things and it's not on onus on the teacher to stand at the front and go like let's all be really positive about our bodies you know because they might be mm. having a really tough day or they mm. might be feeling yep. really bad about themselves that day and so then you know it's a lot to ask Yes. And you bring up such a great point because, um, I mean, the expectation that we have to be 
not perfect, but have all our shit together for want of a better word to be able to teach someone is like, it's flawed because actually the best leaders, if we're looking at Brené Brown's work, which Mm -hmm. has sort of come into huge sort of acclaim over the last decade is that it's not about having everything worked out. It's about being able to fully see ourselves for who we are and with great self-compassion, accepting that we are good enough, whatever that looks like. So this thing here that I've been talking about on our chest was about the shame. It's not about working through that whole thing, but being able to look at it, look Mm -hmm. at it and just go, yeah, wow, that's really there. And I've got tools and techniques for when the shame monster spikes and I still have mine, you know, when the shame monster spikes, well, what do I do to care for myself in that moment, Mm -hmm. right? And body positivity, well, I certainly feel in, in our family, the conversations have been not that, you know, bodies are great and everything is awesome, but our conversations are more the critical, like what the world tells us about bodies mm-hmm. and that we all inevitably, we all inevitably are affected by that unless we have been raised on a piece of land somewhere that has no media, no nothing. So it's not about um, sort of not having a great, body image to be able to teach it it's more about having a great awareness of the impact that the world we live in has on us and living with that day to day and paying attention to it and noticing it and be able to speak to it because like I had a question came in come in for sitting in a car my podcast the other day which was um my seven-year-old is telling me that her thighs are chubby and could we find out what what a thin person looks like on the internet and so that's the sort of and and that the mom who asked me that question was saying things like I've done everything right though like I never criticize my body we talk about how bodies are strong and awesome and doesn't matter what shape or size they are um so what do I do now and this is what we do now we fully acknowledge the brokenness of the world in which we live Mm -hmm. and we lean into empathy. And again, I know I'm talking about this, like it's super easy, but this can take years of work and learning to be be able to do this. Um, Empathetic for all of us who in some way struggle with um, what our body looks like, how it moves, what it feels like and how we wish it was different and better. No, and, and it's the empathy and the caring and the compassion that comes in around really thorny issues like that that can make such a massive difference to how people feel about themselves because they're not broken our kids are not broken if they have these things they're just they're just a product of the world in which we live and we are here to support them as adults i heard you i heard you talking um on your latest podcast about porn and you know this is one of the major questions that came in is like everything from how do I talk to my kids about porn how do I protect my kids from porn how do I stop them from seeing porn what happens if someone tells them about porn what happens if they're watching deviant porn like what do I do what do I do right around the whole topic of the thing if I talk to them about porn is that going to make them watch more porn you know all these different things and I thought that it was really clear when I heard you talking and I thought that this really related back to the body positivity thing because one of the major things that came up for me about porn was not so much in and of itself like the watching of the porn that was the problem for me it was more that the types of bodies that were being seen there in the media and also in the porn wouldn't necessarily be representational of the type of bodies that my son for example would be interacting with in the real world and what misinformation that might give him or different programming that might give him about his body and the bodies he was interacting with and I thought you said a really nice thing around your family watching Marvel and and how that helps you understand it and I wondered would you be able to say explain that analogy again because I thought it really helped me understand how I could talk to him about that. Yeah. And I'm not the first sex educator to talk about the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but I'm probably the most enthusiastic one to talk about the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Big fan. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Um, So when we think about having conversations with kids about porn, there are lots of different points that we can talk about. But one of them is that it's not realistic. It's not information that teaches us how to do something it's more education uh it's more uh what's that word entertainment so in the same way that in 
the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Thanos finds the five, I'm going to get really nerdy now, gets all the stones in his glove and he snaps his finger and half of the universe's living beings are gone. Like we watch that movie and we go, okay, that's really interesting as an entertaining concept and maybe as something we can think about philosophically, but it's not, it doesn't teach us about real life. Like if we have um, problems with how we see the world, we don't go looking for all these stones, right? It's just something that- <laughs> Maybe we, we should. Enjoy, yeah. <laughs> maybe they're out there. <laughs> yeah. And so in this- <laughs> <laughs> or in the same way, like if we see some sort of sex in a video or two naked people or three naked people or four naked people in a video doing whatever it is, we don't use that as a sort of a template for what we do in our real life because we know that there's all sort of special effects. They might have um, been using uh, some sort of, they might have had surgery to change what their body looks like. They may be using some sort of if I'm talking to a child, I'll say medicine, some special medicine to help their penis do that thing. Um, there may be a special effect for, you see all that liquid coming out of there? That's probably a, a special effect that most bodies won't do that in real life. They also, you might be watching this thing for three minutes, but actually that's taken three hours to make that because mm. they're doing little bits at a time and, and those people are stopping and they're having some food or the director is telling them, you know, whatever, and then they're lifting some weights to make their arms look big. How we unpick all those sort of things to make our child understand that this that it's not reality and it's not real life is super important. And, and again, to not shame them for maybe curiosity that has taken down that track and they've Googled Dick Van Dyke or whatever, and then other dicks have come up on their Google search. And to say, look, sometimes we see this stuff by mistake and it's not your fault. Um, come to me and talk about it because for some kids, when they see naked people, um, it can make them feel anxious or afraid. For some children, it can be very interesting and they're, they're, um, they, they have questions about it. So you can come to me and ask that because really those things are not for kids. It would be trying to like read the encyclopedia when you're only six years old. That's not a good way to learn about bees mm -hmm. or plants, is it? Come to me and I will help you understand the information that you need. So we're, we're not shaming porn and maybe our child seeing porn because if our child sees porn it doesn't mean they're broken it just means they need additional support from us to help make sense of that even if they've searched it up they yeah. need additional support from us to to understand what this all means um, in life and, and and yeah sorry so do you think once kids are sexually active kids teenagers are sexually active uh, what's the average age of kids having sex these days? Less like 13, Ooh. 14, I think it's quite young anyway. Mm. Something like that. But anyway, do you believe that there's a role and believe is probably whatever, but it's it's getting into that territory, um, that there's a role for sexual imagery, erotica as part of their sexual education? Do you think that that's actually like a valid thing? So erotica or sexual digital sexual content, mm. consensually created, ethically created, has a place for people of all different walks of life. So sometimes when I'm talking to a group of parents, this, this question will come up and I'll say, well, look, um, imagine you're in a relationship with someone and they have been given a contract. They're an engineer and they've got a contract to go over to Dubai for two years and you want to stay in your monogamous relationship. What role could um, erotica or pornography play in your ability for both of you to stay committed and not take another sexual partner, right? Or what about um, we are raising a young person um, on the autistic spectrum, for example, who or someone with a, a physical disability, which means that the culture out there sees them as less desirable and, and therefore they're having a more difficult time finding a physical partner who is interested in doing um, erotic or sexual things with them. Mm -hmm. Does porn have a role to play in that? Mm -hmm. um, and what about a couple in their 80s who their sexual selves are completely different to what they were in their 20s and they still want to have 
um, and enjoyment with each other, it does porn have a part to play in that if they're both interested in that. And I think when we start considering different ways in which um, erotic material can support diverse people's sexuality, it maybe allows our mind to be slightly unlocked from the very sort of binary mm. positions of porn is bad and it's a damaged um, industry and there's nothing good about it into this sort of gray area of, you know what, the more I think about it, um, I never thought about the fact that there could be audio porn, for example, audio erotic and how, how does that, does that feel more accessible to my mind in terms of healthy sexuality, whatever healthy sexuality looks like, or even written forms of like, we wouldn't necessarily call, we'd call that erotica, wouldn't we? But why is that called erotica and, and things that we, that we look at visually are called porn? And what is the difference between um, those two words? And how is erotica more sort of acceptable than pornography? Like, you know, I've got a really super friend, Car Dr. Caroline West, and she would be sort of the go-to person about porn in Ireland. So you, you must have her on, but she would even have more things to say about this in greater detail because... Mm -hmm. Our culture is just too binary in our thinking about about all this area. Yeah, fascinating. Can we talk into the idea of pleasure and mm. conversations around pleasure coming into a sexual edu education curriculum? Because I know that this is particularly, it's the thing that came up the most for people. Um, and amongst my circle of friends, it was the things that people were saying again and again, this is the conversation. This is the one that never happened for us. And this is what we wish. And um, I wanted to relay that my friend sent a message saying that she had recently worked with a group of 20 year old women and they were all in relationships and were all sexually active. And that she said to them, like, are you all enjoying sexual intercourse and the actual act of the sexual intercourse? And they all resoundingly said no. And she asked them had they had an orgasm. And most of them said they had never had an orgasm. And she was saying, it's so essential that we bring the conversation of pleasure into sex education because it has become so performative. Mm. And the questions that are being asked now by kids who are entering into sexuality versus when we were even younger, when I had my first sexual experience, it was like, do I like this? And do they like this? It wasn't, do I look good? And does he look good or does mm -hmm. she look good, right? And so I think that that's a really important thing, but it is also one of the most triggering things, I think, for a lot of people listening will be like, oh, definitely don't start talking about like sex as we do, especially yeah. within a Catholic framework, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so how can we imagine a way and why is that important why is it so important to bring the idea of pleasure in and how can we get more comfortable with bringing that idea of pleasure in mm. it's such a beautiful question so when we think about pleasure in the human experience that's not just about sex is it mm. like we could probably name all the different things that give us pleasure like in fact, I am taking great pleasure from talking to you today because the conversation, it is a particularly high level, it engages my mind and I enjoy it a lot. So that is a form of pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, when my kids were younger, seeing them jump on the trampoline, the, the embodied pleasure that you could see on their face, right? Um, someone's birthday and we made a particularly delicious cake full of jellies on the top, like eating that or even cooking that was pleasurable so when I think about having conversations with young children because absolutely we can have conversation with young children about the fact that our body feels pleasure that's mm -hmm. not just about genitals mm -hmm. right that's about all different parts of being human and how um, our body and our mind and can feel wonderful and so I transition if ever I'm coming into a conversation, my, the strategy I teach all the parents who come into my, to my courses would be, how can we find another example of what feels beautiful and pleasurable and wonderful on our body or to our mind and then draw a parallel with it? So mm -hmm. using the, the trampoline conversation, you know, um, I learned something new today. That would be a sentence starter that I would give most parents who work with me because it's a great in to start something you might not have talked about before. I learned something new today that um, humans can feel 
happy and wonderful and pleasurable. And that adults don't often talk to kids about the way that bodies can feel nice. So what are some of the ways that your body feels nice? And our kid might say, oh, I like being in the bath or um, I like the feeling of hugging the dog or jumping on the trampoline or I enjoyed it when I was um, eating my lunch with Ricky and we shared his packet of crisps because I don't get those at home, you know. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so um, we're going, yeah, those are all times that just feel beautiful. Um, either to our mind or to our body. And you know what? We haven't had the conversation yet that um, your genitals and, and pretty much everyone's genitals can feel really nice too. And maybe we can talk about that again soon, right? And so you just put it into a little bit of a conversation about some other things that feel nice. And then maybe the next day you could come back and say, you know, I was thinking about that conversation we had um, and all the things you were telling me. And just was so happy to hear about all the things that are joyful for you. And then a few days later, come back and say, I think we need to talk about genitals again, because I realized we haven't talked about that. So the idea is that, that mm -hmm. these are tiny little micro conversations that we have in an ongoing way in our family, and that we can attach a conversation about body pleasure or sexual pleasure to other forms of pleasure that we might find easier to talk about with our child. And therefore that frees us up. Yeah, smart. God, I feel like we kept you for a long time. <laughs> there's, just, there's so much. It's like everyone's like, like, and oh, yeah, and that. But like, it just jumps very, off into like. challenging because I feel like this could be like hours of the whole day. I would keep having more and more questions. And um, so maybe we'll have to turn this into like a little mini series yeah. where we just come back <laughs> if you'll have us mm. and, and talk okay. more into these things. Because I think this is like a. This is like an opening idea and maybe we need to go away and like it's percolate. It's like the conversation that Sarah's talking about. It's, yeah. like, it's exactly that. This is like just little blips, but regular blips. And people yeah. see start to open up to things. Yeah. Uh, and you I, have to go from I zero think, to hundred. Yeah. I, and I, I just, there's an important message because there could be some people listening to this who are like, because that was a quite a high level conversation we had, right? Because we wanted to go there, but there may some be some people that are watching this that are raising small children at home that are going, okay, like I'm pretty convinced that these conversations are really important and there's lots of them to have, but, and I, I know Sarah's given some tips and tricks and skills and all that, but like, mm -hmm. I feel like there's, I don't know how to start and I mm -hmm. don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to say that that's absolutely normal and makes absolute sense for the way most of us were raised. You're not broken. You're not a bad parent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the next step is to work out, okay, now that I know this, where can I go to find the community and find the support and get that ongoing information to start building these skills? Because mm -hmm. um, it's actually an act of violence to consider that you should be able to do this on your own. I mean, yeah that's rubbish right yeah. yeah so let's all be kind to ourselves and go okay we, our kids need our help mm. but at the same time how do we do this in a way that feels really gentle and comp compassionate and supportive for us as mm. the adult yeah cool yeah. Um, and so you you um have a, a course that parents can do in and around learning to talk to their kids not just around sex i think but also around like any topic with some framework stuff can you just tell us a little bit so that if people yeah. were listening they were kind of inspired to action where they could go what, what that might look sure. like so um that's called the evolve school and so the idea is that it's, it's a course that helps us evolve to the point where we can build even deeper connections with our growing children. Um, and we do that by learning to have comfortable conversations about sensitive stuff, mainly around sex and bodies and masturbation and all those sort of things. And um, it's designed to not just give parents the what to say, but also look at those skills that I've been talking about, like the empathy and how do we start conversations and then how do we look at what we've been given as an adult and start learning how to treat ourselves kindly and with compassion and how do we sort of unpack what we've been given because like i said this isn't a sort of a thanos snap mm. of the fingers um and so um people that that course runs twice a year it's not open all the time because i put a lot of energy into it because like I've been saying you know to have a guide someone who is a little bit ahead of you on the journey is the thing that I find helps parents because 
they're not on their own. If any questions come up, they can be answered straight away. Because so many of us, when we're trying to do something new, unless we have someone who we trust, who can answer our very specific question about my child said these words, and I'm definitely pretty sure they're broken and I've done a bad <laughs> job. Unless we have someone saying, no, you're not broken. Your kid is awesome. This is what you need to do. Then we can move along that journey. So the Evolve School has been my way of packaging everything up um, that I know supports parents to do this work at home um, and make it easier for everyone involved. Amazing. And um, so they can find that. Do you have a website or a Facebook or a um, what? So sarahsproul.com is where my website, but Instagram is really the place. I do a lot of work on Instagram. So my free my podcast comes out every week on IGTV. Um, I, my DMs are open for questions which I will then take and answer inside sitting in a car as mm. well which is the podcast and so it's a really if I do say so myself an easy entry level of just starting to get a li little bit more familiar with what is possible for mm. families when one courageous adult will step forward and go you know what I've decided that I am going to break the patterns of silence and shame in my family because, you know, this far and no further, I want something different for my kids. Good for yeah, you. Amazing, Hang Sarah. On. So exciting. Well, um, we would love to have you back I'm for gonna, a third I, time. I, I can attest to it as well, just because I'm not even a parent, but I get so much from your sitting in a car as, just as a language school. Mm -hmm. Like that's that's mm -hmm. really where I feel like there's so much in that, just like the, the breaking down and the granulation of language so that it just doesn't feel like you're dealing with massive topics anymore mm -hmm. it's that, that's what you do so so well and thank you for doing that so so mm -hmm. well together for, for us today yeah I Thanks. think it's, it's really that because I know that like it's something I'm so passionate about and so interested in and then my danger is not the not talking about it but that like making it too lofty and too passionate you know mm. i get too like Nan, this is what yeah. i really think i want to you know say it all. um and so it's it was really great for me to hear them topics that i would feel comfortable talking about but crystallized into ways that make them really child friendly mm. and really easy to digest and really just not like a big deal just yeah. like yeah. just really exactly. normal really normal and that's that's like the skill i think isn't it absolutely mm. yeah. and so yeah let's have sarah back for Therefore. part two of this absolutely. little thing yeah. imagining sex ed curriculum mm. and yeah we plan to have um caroline on we hope yeah. <laughs> I mean, i've been dming her annoyingly we have to hunt her a little harder we, hunt her down. <laughs> um, we can put in a good word for us maybe I will. um so yeah we want to just say thank you to our sponsors that's it really thank you to news s nutrition um our fantastic uh, nutrition partners and who obviously I sell in the shop and we all take and we have a great time with and uh, we're going to be putting out some lovely content about about nice kind of vegan protein powders and playing games with them very soon so and stay tuned for that they have kids products now which they is launched do. last year which is very exciting so you can have the protein powder and the good green stuff all mixed into one for kids which is super easy because you can just give it to them in a smoothie or I make an ice pop and then my son gets one after school and he thinks that's very exciting yeah and he loves them but he also knows what's in them so it's not like hide the good stuff don't tell them about it but it's so delicious yeah. that we love it and exactly. it's a treat yeah um so yeah case. you can get them too that's called kids good stuff exactly and the medium is the message when it comes to kids nutrition right yeah. um so uh yeah then also we have fantastic clear light saunas uh we think everybody should make make it your your life's purpose to work to put aside money in a piggy bank and get there and we will help you as well we have uh we're ambassadors for them so we'll be helping you to get a discount code so when you're if and when you're ready to to jump on board with the infrared sauna as such an important health thing this is not just a she she like spa ritual thing that's not what it is it's about longevity and it's about feeling good um and then also to swivel um the, the little robot that we record this little guy on so thanks to them but mostly thank you to sarah sproul and it's been an absolute pleasure as always and real insight so thanks again yeah thank you sarah bye bye